Good evening, everyone. My name is Emily Lefevers with the Miami University Alumni Association, and welcome to the rescheduled Taste of Peru event from Alumni Weekend. Today we have with us Alexandra Anyaya Green, leader of the Latinx Alumni Group, Jacqueline Rioja Velarde, Assistant Director of Miami Center for American and World Cultures, Mariana Guy, President of UNIDOS Student Organization, Emily Murillo, Vice President of UNIDOS, and Christina Alcade, Vice President of Institutional Diversity and Inclusion, and Professor of Global and Intercultural Studies. Um, so thank you again for joining us tonight. We do have an ask a question button. So at any point throughout the webinar, you have a question, feel free to put it in the ask, um, use the ask a question button below the screen and we will relay that. Um, and with that, go ahead and take it away, Alex. Well, as you mentioned, my name is Alexandra Anaya Green. I'm class of 2006. And while I was at Miami, I was very active with uh, the Latino uh, Latina Alumni Association and wanted to continue that into my alumni years, um, finding that as life has taken us to different paths, um, the friendships are still there. And so trying to reconnect and bring us back home, you know, to the good memories of Miami. So thank you all for making the time to come back uh, to our rescheduled program today. We've had a wonderful uh, turnout today and we look forward to having more events like this. Again, the, the purpose of the Alumni Association uh, is to continue to uh, network and find ways to interact and support one another, uplift one another, and find ways to kind of document our history for, for the next generation to know um, where our tracks were left, you know, and, and how they can continue the legacies that, that, that were left and to, to thrive. And with that, um, I will actually and quickly um, wanted to talk about kind of in the moving forward, you know, what what the association would like to do. Um, ultimately, the, the dream would be to connect using a, a board and so that we can have a little more of a support planning events like these. We will be meeting hopefully in person next year and uh, and we hope to have a great turnout as well as in the future, I would love to see us perhaps traveling together and exploring some of these places that we are talking about in these webinars together. I think that would be the full circle in getting um, our communities to continue bonding. And with that, let me introduce our speaker um, for today, Jacqueline Rioja Velarde coordinates the Latin American and Caribbean Festival and Cesar Chavez program. She serves as president of the Association of Latin American Faculty and Staff and represents Miami on the Latino Leaders Collaborative Initiative of Southwest Ohio. She also helped start Latinas in Ohio to provide advocacy, mentorship, and education. And she serves on several committees and councils that advocate for people with disabilities. Take it away. Thank you, Alex, and thank you to the Latinx uh, group, to the ex-alumnos, ex-alumnas de Miami for the invitation. Estoy muy feliz. I hope to see over here, where well, I don't see you, but I'm pretty sure among you are some of my former students, and this will be a little bit of the eco-geography of Peru as well for those that took any geography courses or Latin American studies course. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, with you today. I'm going to take a few minutes to introduce, uh, not directly the Pisco Sour, but the context in which uh, this happened and why happened and how happened and when it happens. Uh, before we enjoy the taste of the Pisco Sour and Peruvian cuisine in general. Uh, Peru is a country that is highly diverse. I don't know if Emily, can you? That's perfect. Uh, it's a country that is highly diverse, it is worldwide recognized, particularly for its biogeography. You see over there the three major regions that usually people easily recognize. The Amazon area in the eastern side, that is the largest. In the whole country, the Andean region that is really attractive for people, particularly for uh, the touristic attractions that we have over there. And Machu Picchu is one of the major ones that probably most of you have here in Southern Andean region. 
And uh, finally, the coastal area in the western side of Peru that even though it's not the largest, it's completely the opposite, concentrate the largest population in the whole country. Uh, we are about currently 10 million people uh, living in, or oh, I will say, almost uh, 30 million people in the whole country and almost 70% of the population live along the coast of uh, Peru. Uh, Peru also is well recognized for the different ecoregions. One of the classifications that we have is the by altitude. And within this classification, we have we usually use the Quechua names uh, for the classification that allow us to see the vertical biodiversity from the coastal area, from the ocean, through the, the mountain region towards the eastern area of the Amazon basin. You can see that it's highly diverse in terms of the geomorphology and in terms in general of the geography. And that is really important because allow us to have a, not only different kind of environments, but also amazing uh, resources uh, through the whole country. Emily, can you pass the, the next one? That is what I was talking about. Uh, in terms of uh, what is Pisco made in Peru and what is Pisco? Uh, Pisco actually is a brandy. It's a brandy like grappa, uh, for those that are familiar with the grappa in Italy. Uh, or some people might be familiar also with sake, the Japanese brandy but it's not as strong as the Japanese brandy. Uh, Pisco, uh, the name Pisco actually, actually comes for the place where the production first started in Peru. And Pisco itself is a Quechua name. It's a Quechua name that means bird. We have a lot of different birds around that area that are highly recognized because of the variety of islands also in front of the coastal line of Peru. And that was the name that, that, that basically was assigned for this special brandy. Pisco itself, I'm going to show you, I actually also went to Jungle Gyms this week <laughs> to get another Pisco because there's a variety of Piscos that we can talk about and we will talk about a little later. But usually for the drink that we are going to make today, we are going to use el, el pisco quebranta. I usually have others in the past. I, this was the only one that I found in jungle gyms, but it will make it great. And also we have other kind of pisco, like this, this one that is el pisco acholado, that is a, a little more special because you don't need to mix it with anything. You can take it as it is, and usually is used as an aperitif uh, in many cases. And we have another one. This is my favorite, just because it's dressed also. And this is a pisco acholado. And we will define what kind of pisco will be this. Is uh, for the area of Cañete. In the case of Pisco, as you noted from the bottles that I showed to you, uh, Pisco in general is colorless. It looks almost like water, except if it uh, is a mix of different grapes and can turn a little bit of yellowish uh, to amber color, uh, but in general is really clear. Uh, the production of pisco mostly is concentrated in areas that are really arid along the desert of Peru, along the desert of Chile. And we're going to talk a little bit about the connection between Peruvian pisco and Chilean pisco as well. Uh, and in the case of Peru, there are actually 
identify specific regions where PISCO is produced. And the denominations has to be considered as part of the policies of productions that we have in Peru. Uh, it's produced in Ica, where PISCO is located, also in Lima, Arequipa, in southern Peru, Moquegua, Itana. Those are the regions that are most uh, well known for the production of Pisco. Uh, Pisco itself, uh, the history of this uh, brandy is really interesting because actually it started really while ago. Uh, many people and some chronics uh, reports that when Spain conquered Latin America, Peru and Chile were part of the same territory, the vice royalty of Peru. And uh, since the colonial period, uh, we uh, realized that many of the resources that people from Europe couldn't find in Peru were needed, they started to provide some of the resources to Latin America. One of them was grapes. And that was also highly related to Christianity, to the churches. They brought the first, the first and most selected grapes to Latin America, in this case to Peru and Chile, to produce initially a wine. And later on, they realized particularly that other kind of production can be created uh, with those grapes that didn't really were appropriate for a high quality production of wine. Uh, later on, uh, they also realized that even though for the distillation of wine, they needed to use a uh, good Robles to give some kind of flavor to the different kind of wines. In the case of Pisco, since it's a, a brandy that is colorless, in this case, they needed a really pure system to protect for any influence of other flavors to this kind of brandy. And they decided to use copper pots to avoid that. And also, uh, in terms of uh, use of artisanal kind of uh, practices, they decided to use clay. For example, in this case, if you can see it, this is a bottle of Pisco, but uh, is preserved in this kind of clay bottle that is really, really unique. You won't see that really in other areas or in other regions. I'm not quite sure see if Chile also is using clay, but in the case of Peru, this is one of the productions that mostly is used for uh, exportation, uh, particularly to the US, Hong Kong, and even Holland. Those are the three areas that actually exports of Pisco have a really large demand. Um, Another thing that is really important is that um, the, geography, the geography of Peru uh, really helped to a high quality production of uh, this brandy. You can see a little bit of the uh, scenario over here in this image. If you can uh, pass the next um, slide, Emily. Thank you. This is one of our deserts in southern Lima, close to Pisco, in the area of Lunawana. And Lima itself, the, the capital of Peru, uh, is an irony, is the largest city in Peru, but is in the middle of the desert. And this is how it looks like right now, completely transformed in such a big city. Uh, these are the kind of piscos that uh, you are going to hear about. Uh, many times people have a hard time to decide or select what kind of pisco they would like to try. Uh, usually in Peru, they define four 
eh, different kind of piscos. El puro o pure, in this case, is made with uva quebranta, is the type of grape that is used to produce this kind of pisco. That's why that's the pisco that I have chosen for today. And um, usually you don't blend this pisco with any other kind of grape. That's why it's called a uh, puro, pisco puro. There are other piscos that are aromatics. Uh, in this case, uh, they usually use uh, grapes for the muscat, uh, kind of moscato in Espanol, kind of uh, grapes. And there are different varieties uh, in Peru that were brought uh, in the 70s and 80s, 18th century uh, to Peru. And they use that kind of grapes for the production. There are another one that is called uh, Mosto Verde because uh, they use green mosto uh, or must, as we should say in English. And in this case, the, the process of distillation is a little bit different than the other ones and can be uh, with higher levels of alcohol. The one that we're going to use today is not higher than 44%, but we will talk about, we will talk a little bit more about it in a, a minute. And finally, the pisco acholado that many people really enjoy uh, is a uh, pisco that is produced blending different kind of grapes. So uh, in this case, they use a variety of grapes to produce the acholado. That is the one that I showed to you first and can be drink without any kind of uh, other processes or cocktails or things like that. It's really have a really special taste and it has a little bit of really soft aroma as well. Uh, the pisco in Peru and also in Chile is considered a national drink and there are a lot of debates about <laughs> uh, who actually sort of own the production of, or the, the origin of pisco. Actually, both of them are right because at the time when they started to produce pisco in Latin America, eh, both countries, currently Peru and Chile, were part of the visa royalty of Peru. So the major difference is how they process and how they produce actually this brandy. Eh, both of them claim to be the, the ones. Can you, uh, can you still keep the pass, the last slide, Emily? Thank you. Uh, in terms of the pisco sour it, itself, um, there are many, many theories and many hypotheses where it was first created. But believe it or not, it wasn't created by a Peruvian or it wasn't created uh, by a Chilean. It was created by someone from the US. And uh, his name is Victor Morris. Uh, it's really interested, interesting because he was a bartender over here uh, in uh, live in California for a while, uh, was working in Peru for quite a bit. And uh, he decided to be created and try to see if he can recreate what uh, could have been a whiskey sour and other brandies that are used for other kind of cocktails. And he came up with the idea of using lime juice and also the egg whites and a little bit of uh, syrup to give uh, the cocktail a little nice touch. And also uh, at the end, some drops of bitter and see 
if that will be something that people will be brave enough at the time to try and actually became a really delicate cocktail. Uh, so between actually people think that between 1915 and 1925 is when Pisco Sour became really popular, not only here, uh, meaning in Peru and later in Chile, but also here, particularly in California and in the area of San Francisco where actually currently also there are areas that produce uh, pisco. It's a different process of distillation and production, but a uh, high quality as well. Are you ready to make your pisco sour? Is everybody ready for making a pisco sour today? I hope so. I'm really, really uh, ready and excited to start doing uh, this pisco sour. I think you all receive uh, in advance the ingredients that we are going to use. Um, we're going to use some ice. Uh, in this case, we're going to use the pisco quebranta, um, lemon juice, that is the core of this cocktail in terms of the flavors, uh, a little bit of syrup, sugar syrup, the egg white, and also a little bit of, probably you know this as an aromatic bitter, and in Spanish it's called angostura. Uh, give a really nice touch at the end of the cocktail to finish it. And if you want also something that is really nice to have in a pisco sour is a cinnamon a little bit of cinnamon at the end. Some people also like to have a ring, uh, in some cases, uh, a piece of lime on the glass, but that is up to you how you would like to decorate or present your pisco sour, okay? So I have all the ingredients already ready and measured. It's always really important that you Pay attention to how much you need from each one of the ingredients. Uh, in this case, we are going to need as well a shaker. This has been in the refrigerator most of the day. I just took it out of the refrigerator a few minutes before we started. And um, the only thing that I don't have right now here, but I'm going to get that, is the ice. Okay, we have some ice over here, and this is going to be really easy to follow. Let's open this shaker. We are going to put some of the ice if I don't lose them in the process. The ice is a really key ingredient. Uh, some people usually try to mix everything at the same time with the ice. In my case, I notice that it's better if actually we mix first the ice with the egg whites. So we are going to have the ice over here and the egg whites. And we're going to shake it. Yes, a second. Let's see if it's working. is ready to celebrate. Just let's do a little bit more. I just want to make sure that we're going to have that kind of foam that is created by the egg. And we are going to add now the rest of the ingredients. 
We have here the lime juice, the syrup, and I think that is, I'm looking for the cover over here. And we are going to add a little more ice. At least one more. And shake it again for a few seconds. And let's see what we have here. I think you can use a, a glass like this one that is um, really common for a pisco sour, or you can use a kind of wine glass if you prefer. Let's try this time with this one. Wow. There's something that I should have done. And just let me go back. You don't put the eyes on the glass. You just pour in the glass without the eyes and add few drops of Angostura, the bitter. You can put two or three, depending on your preference. Let's do three in this case. And I always love to add a little bit of cinnamon because of give a really nice touch and aroma as well. And here it is. Salud. I hope everybody was able to follow the instructions and now you can enjoy a nice, really nice pisco sour. And if you have any questions or you have any comments, please feel free to uh, post those on the chat that Alex is uh, checking them right now. Salud con todos. Salud. Cheers. Salud. How was yours, Alex? <laughs> aquí, aquí, muy bien, muy bien. Uh, pregunta, a question. You mentioned that a, a big es export was going to Holland. Why Holland? It, I actually don't know. That is something that I was trying to explore because I was completely... Uh, it was out of the blue to see that kind of information. Uh, maybe just because of a uh, migration over here, sometimes things happen because someone saw the opportunity for doing business over there. I have no idea, but it's something that I would like to continue to explore and see why Holland. I understand Japan because of the connection with a similar kind of liquor like the sake that they have over there. There's also a large uh, immigration of Peruvians in Japan since the 1980s. I even have family members that currently live there and have their families over there for quite a bit, at least 20 or more years already living over there. But um, I don't know that case of Holland. That's what I was hoping you would say. Maybe there was a large community of, of uh, Peruvians in Holland that I wasn't, you know, wasn't on my radar. Uh, we do have a, a question from some of uh, our participants today. Best foods to pair with pisco sour or just pisco in general? Oh, the best food is seafood. Always, always seafood. People like to have a nice ceviche or a different kind of mariscos or seafood seafood like you know trim actually I was going to make a, a causa rellena that is a, a special dish in Peru it's uh, made with potatoes as much potatoes uh, yellow peppers that are spicy but not that spicy like really hot 
And you can stuff that with tuna and onions and avocado and it's ready to go. I'm going to show you maybe in another, another opportunity <laughs> uh, how to make those kind of dishes. But also um, it can, you know, you can have in this case, for example, I just have some cheese and uh, crackers and I have some nuts and I have some berries in Peru. Well, we have amarantos and other kind of cherries but usually seafood is the best uh, for a good pisco sour. Okay, and, and also red, uh, some, you know, with wine, like red meat, white meat. Um, yeah, which really, traditionally is paired with seafood, but actually pisco sour is a perfect uh, touch for any kind of <laughs> gathering. You just enjoy it. You can spend the whole time either, you know, lunch or dinner or just uh, a little gathering informal reunion or something like that wonderful another question we had come in uh, why the egg white why why an egg white with with the, the egg white actually morris was the one that added the egg white and okay. thought since he was a bartender he really liked to explore <laughs> uh, different possibilities and he noticed that adding that egg white and the lime juice reduce the level of alcohol from pisco oh. make it a little softer okay okay that's good to know that way you can have more pisco sours is that yes. is that the goal <laughs> um another question are you peruvian or have you ever visited peru i'm peruvian i'm peruvian i was born in peru i'm peruvian by heart and my son was born in Peru as well, even though uh, my partner is not Peruvian, but became Peruvian. He's taking his students to study abroad in Peru most of the time. Wonderful. And, and I am not Peruvian, but I spent a lot of time uh, in graduate school actually playing in a Peruvian um, music ensemble. And oh, our, our, my professor had spent much time there and would bring back Pisco and explain to us how uh, the indigenous communities use Pisco in a lot of the festivals, uh, multi-day festivals, and, and that it helped with the altitude and also just keeping the festivities going. Uh, when you're playing pan pipes, you're expelling a lot of uh, oxygen. And so to kind of counterbalance and keep the, the momentum going that, that the Pisco was used. And so that's how I was introduced to it was from a music perspective. Um, and yeah, I found that after a few Pisco, a shot of Pisco, man, I could play for hours. Um, and <laughs> And well, I was going to climb the mountain. <laughs> to be playing, yeah, yeah. So yeah, and you're right because also another um, application that Pisco have initially when they thought that Pisco might be more like an aguardiente okay. uh, was for me uh, medical purposes, like alcohol, any other kind of alcohol. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, I think as an ecologist, I, I love to learn and understand kind of how, like you said, medicinal purposes, cultural festival, um, you know, the uh, introduction of an American bartender and, and how kind of a drink travels and, and becomes a part of the culture and identity. Um, yes, definitely. Of, of a community. Um, wonderful. Um, any other, uh, we had another question also, how can I connect with the Latino Latina alumni? Um, well, that was kind of the, the goal of this, right? Was to get us to continue the conversations and, and meet you know, new and uh, other alumni. And so if you're happy to, um, you know, keep up with what we're planning or you have some ideas, we're very open to it. There is, if you're on Instagram, MU Latino alum, M U L A T I N O A L U M. Um, we're rather active on there, and Seth is wonderful as far as promoting uh, so the, the accomplishments of our alumni and professors and accolades and things like that. So, do you, um, if you haven't already, snap a picture 
of you know your creation and having a good time and post it on there and and that way you know we can thank you for putting that up there emily so that we can continue the conversations going and, and meet new people and you might realize um how many connections we really have and and a lot of us went through so many of these similar programs that we're going to continue talking about today um and share our experiences and kind of what we learned and and how they have followed us in um in our life post miami i know a lot of the things i learned in as far as leadership and and promotions and just community building um came from my time at miami and these associations because uh they were rather small and a lot of times many of us had to wear multiple hats right and so um that's the goal of all this right is to have some fun have some drinks um you know and, and thinking of of new ways to continue engaging my my next plan is i'm thinking maybe having a um coquito contest at the mm -hmm. next night meeting and you know bring those coquito recipes i know come christmas time uh while i'm not puerto rican i have a lot of puerto rican family and um and friends and i'm always looking for a new recipe including ones that are you know gluten-free and vegan and all this so that we can uh all enjoy it so you know maybe we'll stick on this trend for a little bit <laughs> wonderful um other brandies and wines like you mentioned um if and there, is a, there are a variety of, if if emily can pass the next slide i just wanted to see to show you a list of other uh, cocktails that uh, can be made with pisco Please. emily i don't know if you can show that slide it says most popular cocktails with pisco and there's one that probably you try alexandra is a uh, algarrobina Yep, give me one second. I'm gonna pull that back up. I apologize. Yeah, no, that's okay. Uh, we have pisco punch that was more the American style. Uh, we have a chilcano that is a mix with ginger ale, but also there's a pisquinha that is um, very similar to the Brazilian capirinha. There we go. It's really, really good. Mojito made with pisco instead of tequila, and a, a lot of other variety uh, variety of cocktails. Those are some of them over there. People are really creative with any kind of uh, possibilities and maximize them. And uh, just this is the, the last slide that I wanted to show you because I took that actually from a university from Peru. Uh, that reported some of the amazing importance of the production of pisco, particularly for export exportation. Uh, these are some of the levels of consumption that we have in our own country and the production uh, from 2018 that I was really amazed to hear about. And uh, particularly there's how large it is in Southern Peru, Ica, where Pisco is located, has almost 35% of that production. That is wow. really significant, really, really significant. And also um, is more and more attracted to other kind of markets. I think uh, from Peru that promotes the, the exports of uh, our country is doing a great job not only with um, the production of asparagus or mango or avocado that were really high in the last decades uh, after the neoliberal reforms, but also with Pisco. And it seems like Pisco is becoming even larger than these other products uh, being sold uh, beyond the borders of Peru. Yeah, we have a few more minutes for the Q&A. I'd love to hear some feedback as you're drinking and enjoying tossing them back. Let us know what you think, you know, is it what you thought? Is it strong? Is it sweet? Is it sour? You know, what like are you tasting the flavors? Um, I'd love to hear from from everybody kind of what uh, what your feedback is. And and also you gave a wonderful list. Thank you of different drinks that you can make with it. You have a whole bottle now, right? So they have no excuse to try something new. But also um, I've also enjoyed just Pisco tastings when I've gone out yeah. to restaurants. Um, and so, you know, if you're having some friends and family over and, and you're intimidated by, you know, being a mixologist and mixing them, what about just doing a tasting, right? Some three shot glasses, four shot glasses, get a few different type of piscos and just pour them pure and compare. Um, 
that's a good time I've, I've, <laughs> I've experienced as well. But I think also an interesting way to, um, to challenge your palate, right? I mean, um, we may have become more accustomed to other types of, of drinks and, and wines and like, you know, whiskeys and stuff, but why not the Pisco? And, and now that you have kind of this wonderful knowledge, all right, we've got a few, uh, we've got the surprise that it's sweeter than I thought thought it would be more sour than it is, some of the feedback that's coming in. Yeah. And you can balance according to your palette. You can, you know, put a little more or less of any of the ingredients. We got another one. It actually tastes good with egg. Wasn't sure I'd like that. Yeah, I think the egg is a little intimidating. It was for me too. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I think, yeah, you know, you had a bartender who knew what he was doing and, and combined some flavors there. Good, good. Um, I'm also more curious too to to learn about to to do some more digging, like you mentioned about the um, the pisco in in the uh, San Francisco. Is it is it in the Napa region? Um, yeah, you know? it's in the winery area, and okay. um, and San Francisco actually is the one that initiated it, and it's, it seems like it's spread all over California. Yeah. Um, so I really curious about that. I just came back from California actually, but no, this time we couldn't go to explore anything. But the next time I'm pretty sure I would love to see um, what kind of Pisco, how the production goes, what is the, you know, the response for people. It seems that people love it over there, even when it was initiated in the 19, in the 20th century. Yeah, I, I'm from San Francisco. I moved back um, about eight years ago to the Midwest. And there's quite a large Peruvian community in, in the Bay Area. And so I would regularly attend um, different Peruvian restaurants just to sample. And yes, very much. Pisco was um, plentiful and, and a lot of variety. And so mm -hmm. again, that's kind of where I really started falling in love and introducing it to my friends and family. And now, you know, they have that knowledge and, and uh, a, a different palate as well we've got one more someone said that was great it seemed this would work well with orange juice too oh so yes and I, I, will say, I will say you something i wanted to make this one but i didn't it now <laughs> you can make it with maracuya with passion fruit is delicious oh. instead of lime juice you can use maracuya or passion fruit is uh, the fruit and it's just the most delicious it's a delicatessen of pisco sour it's really good. Yeah, for, for the vegan uh, friends that would like to skip the egg, or you're just not into egg, that's a good suggestion as well. Um, thank you. Is there, is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, I just want to really thank you, uh, the Latinx alumni group. I really always thinking about you. Uh, I really love seeing you coming to Miami. and. Thank you, Alex, for this great initiative and your continue to su support, to connect uh, all of them. And all of them are here actually for your enthusiasm, your passion and your commi commitment to bring them back. Uh, thank you everybody that participate today and you're invited to the Uni Diversity Festival. Many of you, I'm pretty sure, were volunteers at your times at Miami. It's going to be September 17 this year. Hope to see some of you over here if you have the opportunity to come back to our campus. Thank you to um, Seth as well and Ellie, um, Emily and um, any other time, I will be more than happy to come back to join this initiative. Thank you so much. I think um, we lost Alex for a second, so I'm gonna go ahead. Um, we are going to hear from um, Mariana and Emily. They um, are going to talk about themselves and the student organization that they are involved in at Miami. So I'm gonna go ahead. Thank you so much, um, Jackie, for leading us through that. It was wonderful. Um, so and while we wait for Alex to get back, I am going to add uh, Mariana and Emily. Hello, hello everyone. Like Emily said, my name is Mariana and this is Emily. I'm the president of Unidos and Emily is the vice president. Um, we are, Unidos is our Latinx student organization on campus. If you were at school during Alex's time, during any time, honestly, before this year, you would have had two organizations, 
we combine those two to create Unidos. So we're very happy to have those. We've been an organization since 2018, I do believe. And it's been very fun. Our large focus is on fostering that community, fostering that development with Latin American students and with all our different cultures, learning from each other, learning more about ourselves, um, using those connections to connect more with our culture and really create a home for us here at Miami. Uh, so yeah, that being said, um, this summer we are partnering with Miami University, Move in Miami program, I'm sorry, and the Global Initiatives Department to fundraise for the Unidiversity Scholarship Program. So that is a scholarship that allows Hispanic and Latinx students to fund their education here at Miami, whether that be through helping with like tuition, with meal plan, with housing, or with just like buying books. Um, so last year we did surpass our goal of $500. So today, we're, this year, so we're hoping to do the same thing. We're well on our way, but if you could donate to us, if you feel so moved, that would be great. You can donate to our donation page at givetomiamioh.org slash unidos. And just really thank you for your continued support here. And I'll toss it back to Emily. Yeah, and it looks like we lost the other Emily as well. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, you know, Wi-Fi just does not co cooperate, which is why um, Seth wasn't able to join us tonight. Um, oh, we have Alex back. Here you are, Alex. So sorry about that. No problem. Um, so, Alex, if you are okay, do you want to go ahead and introduce Christina? Of course. Thank you. Thank you, Mariana. We have uh, Christina Alcal. I think we may have lost to Alex again. Sometimes Wi-Fi is just not on our side. So I will go ahead and introduce you, Christina. Um, so we have Christina Alcade. She is our new, um, oh, there's Emily. I apologize for her. Sometimes this does not, just does not go. So Christina is our new, um, Miami's new Vice President of Institutional Diversity and Inclusion. She actually just joined us earlier this month on July 1st. Um, in this role, she will provide vision and leadership um, for university-wide diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, advancement, and enhancement. Um, she also will be um, a full professor in the Department of Global and Intercultural Studies. Um, she is currently a professor of gender and women's studies at the Marie Rich Endowed or, um, University of Kentucky. So thank you so much for joining us this evening, Christina. I will go ahead and turn it over to you. Great, thank you so much. So I, um, as Emily just mentioned, I just joined this month, so I'm thrilled to be here. And actually I'm from Lima, from Peru, uh, like uh, like Jackie. So I'm really excited and listening to her talk about and showing the um, cocktails and pisco sour really makes me miss all those cocktails and the ceviches and family. So I'm also an anthropologist who has focused on Peru for much of my work and my research. So it's exciting to join this and to hear about Peru because this is much of what I focus on. Uh, and I, you know, I talk about pisco sours and I talk about Inca Cola and ceviches, which I hope everyone also finds more about. Um, and also, you know, I just want to mention before I talk a little bit about the Office of Institutional Diversity that next week is also um, 28 de Julio, which is Peruvian Independence Day. So you're going to have Peruvians all over the world drinking lots of pisco sours. So you should uh, definitely join in and on the 20th and the 28th. So I just joined and my goal is to be able to reach out to all alumni, learn more about your experiences. I'd really, I'm excited about working towards a more inclusive environment and really focusing on more systemic university-wide approaches to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I invite you to please write me and I will actually, put, I don't know if I can, if someone can put my email in the chat or if I can and you'll see it, but I'd love to learn more about alumni experiences with Latinx Hispanic Heritage Month coming up too. I'd love the opportunity to um, invite people and organize something so that everyone can learn more about our Latinx alumni experiences and really learn from them and see how we can move forward and see how I can support that. So again, thanks for including me in this and I really look forward to working with all of you. Wonderful. We're so happy to have you on board. I, I, you know, when we started thinking about how we could uh, get together in this pandemic world, 
Um, I really wanted to touch base and, and get excited and talking about a different region of Latin America that I think sometimes gets omitted a little. Um, and, and Peru came to mind again because, uh, well, I'm partial to it myself. And I, little did I know that we have so much Peruvian representation on campus. So, um, you know, again, if you guys have any good ideas or you have a region of, of the world that maybe we haven't had a chance to really explore, um, please, please uh, uh, send, um, send myself, send Seth uh, at the uh, MU Latino alum, you know, send on there. That's my Instagram handle, Anaya underscore green. Um, I love to be on there and, and just communicating with people and kind of seeing, you know, Feeling, feeling the temperature of, of how we can find new ways that are fun to get together. Um, because there's there's just so much, we've got a really fun group. And, and I think that for me, um, welcome to the Miami family, first of all, we're happy to have you. Um, but I found that, you know, the, the students that we had there then and now really have a great time. I mean, they're good, good, fun uh, people that, that know how to party. And post and that's really what I missed um, was that that camaraderie um, and so I wanted to continue the party going if you will you know in in as many ways as, as I could possibly think of um, so I we wish you so well and and we thank you for for um, accepting you know this new journey and we look forward to seeing kind of how we can continue to support our students um, with unidos and um, I, you know, also post our graduation, I found that that was a tough time when you graduate. Um, kind of, well, what's next? You know, how can I use these? This is our network, right? And a lot of the organizations I'm finding have these really strong networks. And and I applaud um, Seth Seward. I, I apologize. He's having some uh, technical internet issues. He um, usually is, is here with us. Um, but he has been very, very active and, and just wanted to give a, a big thank you for his role in, in supporting um, this alumni group from its from day one when he arrived. I said, I have some ideas and um, he just chuckles and goes with it, you know, and so no idea has been too big or too scary for for him in Miami to tackle. And so I, I, I truly uh, thank you um, for this and um uh, also, a quick special invitation to everyone, um, whether you're local or you're looking for you know, a little trip, you're getting stir crazy, we invite you and hope to see you September 17th uh, on Miami's campus for the Universal uh, University Festival celebration. And so again, that's September 17th, all are invited. Um, as you know, that's usually a big fundraiser, but also a celebration of, of our community and our space there at Miami. Um, let me see if there's uh, anything else. There we go, the diversity. And um, again, yes, please post those pictures. We want to see, you know, the, the party continue. And we very much look forward to the next time that we can be together and celebrate and meet, um, meet new, you know, alumni. There's um, some that I'm realizing I'm going, I, I went to school with their older brother or their cousins. And even though they, you know, graduated 10 years later, that I have a connection with, with those alumni and um, that I, I know the family. I have once one alumni who her father was, was my professor. And when she started telling me about her dad, who was this musician who played the trombone, all of a sudden I said, wait a minute, you know, is Jaime Morales your father? And sure enough, that, that was her father. And so, you know, these connections that we have made throughout the years, um, they still are there. And, and when we get together, it, it truly feels like, you know, we never left. And so we'll continue sending some messages uh, throughout the year, not too much. Um, and uh, as we get closer to next June, we will send out some more information on what the plan is and getting together. But please, if you can, pencil in alumni weekends um, for next year. It's usually, I, I believe, the uh, second weekend of June. And um, it's just a great time. You can stay in the dorms a lot of times um, if, if you don't want to hassle with, with the hotels. But get those hotels you know, early and um, and the party will continue. So again, we thank you all for your time. And I, I know it's just one more Zoom call, but the, this one at least had some peace go with it. So we truly hope that you have enjoyed yourselves and, and that um, 
by the time that Pisco bottle has finished, you have had a chance to enjoy it with some friends and families and some new stories. So from the bottom of our heart, uh, we always say um, amor y honor, love and honor in Spanish to, to everyone. And please stay connected. Again, you have the uh, MU Latino alum, as well as LinkedIn. There is a page on there as well that um, we, we can connect as well. So there's many, there's a Facebook group. Um, so there's many ways for you to stay you know, in communication. But again, thank you so much and, and Sarah and everybody uh, for, thank you so much for taking the time to, to let us know kind of what's going on on campus and that we are doing well as a community there. Yes, thank yes. you so much to you, Alex, for hosting this wonderful event tonight. Um, and to Jacqueline, Christina, Emily, and Mariana for joining us tonight. It was so wonderful. Um, I, I loved learning everything about the Pisco drink. It was very cool. Um, so there's so many ways you can follow the Latinx. We have our Latinx alumni group. We have um, their Instagram handle. Um, you can follow Alex. If you need to, if you'd like to reach out to Christina, here's her email. Um, the Unidos Instagram is here. Um, we have a LinkedIn Latinx group. Um, you can do that by searching Miami University Latino Alumni Group on LinkedIn. And again, um, the festival coming up on September 17th. And I do want to mention um, Alumni Weekend will be, let's see, June 9th through the 12th next year. So pencil that in. And like Alex said, get your, get your hotel rooms now. Um, yeah. And you can support um, the Unidos group through Move in Miami by going to moveinmiami.org and searching their group on that page. And that is coming up on September 19th or August 19th. I apologize. So please um, look them up and support them through Move in Miami. Can people start donating now? Can they donate today? Yes, they can. Yep. You can start donating today. So use this, go to there and donate today. <laughs> thank you again, guys, and we hope to see you next time. Yes, thank you, everyone. Um, and as Alex said, love and honor. Amor y honor. <laughs>